station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston station, I am ready for the event. The Mandelstam School, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is the Mandelstam School. How do you hear me? Hello, Mandelstam School. This is the International Space Station. Welcome. Hola, Serena. Hola, Serena. This is your cousin, Maleni Aung-Yong Maori in Miami, Florida. Our students at the Mandelstam School are very excited to ask you all sorts of questions. First, I would like to say how proud I am that a member of the Aung-Yong family in the Cuban-American community has achieved the pinnacle of her career working among the stars. Thank you for inspiring a new generation of young scientists everywhere. And now for our first question. Hello, my name is Lola. I am in first grade. My question is, what is your favorite job on the space station? Well, I have to say that my favorite job up here is actually floating to work everywhere I go. And, and floating is part of how we move up here. We can work on any surface. We can work on any wall, on any ceiling. In fact, I can even flip my feet up and talk to you just like this. I can talk to you upside down if I want to because I'm holding on with my feet. I, don't, I can even let this microphone float. And so really all the jobs we do require us to work in different directions. And so part of my favorite, my favorite part of the day is trying to figure out how am I going to get this job done and, and what surface am I going to work on? Hello, my name is Leandro and I'm in fourth grade. And my question is, do you ever get cabin fever in such a small space? And what do you do in your free time? So actually, no, the space station is really big. It's about the size of a five bedroom house. We've got a lot of space in here. So there are some days when I'm working, for example, I'm in the Japanese module right now, and I'll be working in here all morning, and I won't see anybody else until lunchtime because they're working in different parts of the space station. The, the space station truss, which is kind of the, the backbone of the space station itself, that's as long as a football field. So it's a really big object in the night sky. And if you've ever gotten a chance to go outside and watch a space station pass overhead, and there are tons of apps for that, please do. It is absolutely amazing to see. As far as our free time, uh, for example, Saturday nights, we always have movie night with the crew, and somebody it gets their turn to pick a movie, and we've got special movie candy and stuff like that. And so we really enjoy spending time together. We also really like looking out our windows because we get to see our, our beautiful Earth and different phenomena such as aurora, which are beautiful because of all the different colors that we see. Hi, my name is Brody, and I'm in fifth grade. My question is, how do your cells change in space? What organ is most affected during a trip in space? That is a fantastic question. Um, so funny enough, what we've learned recently is that cells in space like to grow just like they do in our bodies. So scientists on the ground really like to look at cells to study them and test things like chemotherapy agents or and that's medicine that can help cure cancer. Um, but scientists have trouble growing those cells for long periods of time when they're outside the body. Well, what they learn is that when cells are up in space, the cells feel like they're in the body. And I think it's because they really feel like they're kind of floating in the blood, just like inside us. And so they really grow very, very well. And it's easier for scientists uh, to perform research studies on these cells. Just a few months ago, we looked at special cancer medicine. Uh, and we were testing those out on cells up here because the cells grew and lived so much better up here than they did on the ground. As far as which organ is most affected, I think all the organs are. The, the ones that we're most concerned about are really the system is what we call our musculoskeletal system. So our muscles and our bones. Those are the ones that change almost immediately once we come up into space and we have to protect them daily uh, to make sure that they don't break down too much while we're up here. Hi, my name is Matias and I'm in fifth grade. My question is, after you eat, does your stomach feel different and does your food float in your stomach? 
You know, I think your food does float in your stomach a little bit. And especially when you first get up here, um, your stomach feels a little more full pretty quickly. So you don't eat as much those first few days, but then your normal appetite comes back. But let me show you what happens with liquids in space. This is kind of neat. So th this is a drink and it's a bag of drinking water and it's got my name on it only because there's lots of us up here and all these bags look the same and we wanna make sure we each keep our own. But nothing pours in space, it doesn't spill in space. It stays in one area and I'll show you why. It's because of something called surface tension. So I'm gonna hold this bubble up real close to the camera, but that bubble is gonna grow and grow and grow and grow until I stop it really. But what's kind of neat about this, watch what I can do. I just transferred that bubble to my hand. It's just sitting right there on the surface of my hand. You can see it wiggling around. It's not gonna go anywhere. It'll sit right there because of surface tension. I can even drink it. And lose part of it like I just did. <laughs> but you know, for us, Eating up here is definitely a different experience. It's fun, we have a lot of fun with it, um, but foods don't act the same. And so you have to quickly adapt your brain and how you eat. Uh, I can, again, I can eat on the ceiling. I can eat on any surface. I can open a package of soup and it doesn't go anywhere because of the surface tension forces I told you about. So this is something that was very new for us when we got up here, but it's fun every day to have dinner. My name is Ella. I'm in third grade. My question is, why did you want to become an astronaut? You know, I remember when I was very little watching shuttle launches over and over with my family, and I was just so intrigued and fascinated by this magnificent vehicle lifting up off the ground and then watching everybody float around and do all the science and, and look at what they how they got to see the Earth. And I was just, it was very easy for me to picture myself there doing those things even at a young age and I would kind of daydream about it all the time. And so what I would tell you is that no matter what you're dreaming of becoming, if, if you see yourself there, then always surround yourself by people who love you, your parents who love you, your family, your friends, because they're always going to tell you that you're able to do something. And, and that was what the case was for me. All my family and friends really supported me and helped me because I knew I wanted to be an astronaut. And it was a long journey, uh, but it moved really, really fast now when I, when I look back on it. So just remember those things and, and always keep in mind that you can do whatever you want to do. Don't let anybody else tell you that it's not possible. Hello, my name is Piero, and my question, and I'm in fifth grade. My question is, how, how do astronauts interact with bacteria or diseases after they've been in space for a long time? Will they make the astronauts sick? That is a fantastic question because we are doing studies up here right now that look at that. And what you're asking about is do bacteria on the space station change? Do they become meaner bacteria or do they kind of stay the same as they are on Earth? And interestingly, some of the bacteria we've studied tend to get a little meaner up here. We're not sure why that is. Could be a number of reasons. Could be the space environment. Could be space radiation that we have all around us. You can't see it, you can't smell it, but it's there. Um, it could be different levels of um, things in the air, like something carbon dioxide, which is something that you breathe out every day. We have a little bit higher level here on the space station. But those bacteria definitely change. And another word for that is mutate. So they change their structure a little bit, and sometimes they get a little bit meaner. Now, the good thing is, and I'll knock on wood, we haven't had anybody up here get very, very sick from any of those bacteria. We do keep this place very clean. We clean the space station once a week, and we use special disinfectant wipes and everything, and we're constantly testing surfaces to see what's growing. Um, but definitely, just as our bodies change, bacteria change too up here. My name is Angelina and I'm in fourth grade, my question is, what did you expect from work and life when you became an astronaut? Was visiting the space station your goal? You know, when I first became an astronaut, I, I knew that I would most likely go to the space station. I didn't know in what vehicle though. I didn't know how long it would take me to train. So I, I sort of had an idea of what might happen, 
but life kind of changes at every moment. And so you just have to stay flexible, really. It was fun, though, to see what journey I went on. There were so many things I got to do during the training period before I went to the space station. I got to spend two months in Antarctica, way down by the South Pole, looking for meteorites. I got to spend two weeks living underwater right off the coast of Florida in the Aquarius habitat. I was an aquanaut. I visited multiple countries. So it was just such a fun time leading up to this mission, getting to experience all these different things and meet so many different types of people. Of course, coming to the space station was absolutely fantastic, but sometimes it's the journey there to that final path um, that's also really interesting that you need to cherish. My name is Walker, and my question is, when you return to Earth, does it take a long time for your body to adjust back to gravity? Well, I certainly hope my hair comes back down because right now it has gotten long and it is sticking way up. So we will see. But uh, everybody's different. Everybody's body adapts differently when they get back to ground. But this is what I say. The body is really a wonderful thing. It adapts very quickly. And your body, at least our bodies, remember what Earth was like. They remember gravity. They remember how you used to walk. So it's kind of like riding a bike. If most of you guys ride bikes, if you haven't rode a bike for three or four months, you hop back on the bike and you can pretty much ride again. It's okay because your body remembers. So it takes a little while for our muscles and bones to get back to where they were. But really, people adapt pretty quickly. And we have a lot of folks working with us to make sure that we do the best things for our bodies, certainly in those first few weeks. Um, but the body is really amazing and it just remembers and it knows where it wants to be. And that's Earth. My name is Zoe, and I'm in third grade. And my question is, do foods and liquids taste the same on the space station as they do on Earth? Well, I'll tell you, they do taste the same. We have to eat special foods up here. We can't go grocery shopping, so all our food is sent up to us in these sealed packages. And I will say this, there's, most of the food is kind of a softer food. We don't get a lot of crunchy food up here, so that's one thing we really miss, like a crunchy taco. We would love to have that up here. Um, but the food, for the most part, does taste the same. Uh, I haven't noticed too much of a difference. The, the really nice thing is when we get a cargo vehicle, for example, we had a vehicle Cygnus just dock, and SpaceX just launched a couple days ago from Florida. And they're bringing us all kinds of cargo for the space station. They also bring us special treats of food. And so we get things like a box of special cookies or crackers that we normally don't get up here, crunchy things. And so it's really fun for us because when we get those vehicles up here, we get to open up our special packages and, and eat our special foods. Um, we do enjoy the food up here. There's a lot of it. But there's also a lot of things that I miss on the earth too, like a cheeseburger. Hello, my name is Felix, and I'm in the third grade, and my question is, what happens if you do not exercise for two hours a day? Yeah, so you're right. We do exercise for two hours a day, and remember a little earlier, I mentioned that the moment we come up into space, our bones and our muscles change immediately, and they know that because they've done special studies on our blood and everything, and they see some of those things happening in the blood. They can tell that the bones are breaking down. So if we did not exercise for two hours a day, our muscles would continue to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And the word for that is atrophy. So our muscles would atrophy, certainly in our legs, in our spine. These are what we call our posture muscles. Our arms generally do pretty well because we move around a lot with our arms. We hold on to things with our arms. But our legs, most of the day, I'm really just floating there. They're not doing a whole lot. They're not holding up my body weight. You know, my feet are kind of doing what they want, dancing in the air, but they're not working really. And so if that were to occur, then we would get weaker and weaker and weaker, and it wouldn't be very healthy for us. Also, our heart. So when you're on the ground on Earth, you don't even know this, but every time you walk around or run or anything, your heart is also pumping blood against gravity. So when you get up here and the heart's not having to work as hard because there's no gravity, it also gets a little smaller and weaker. And so bones are the other thing that 
because you're not holding up your body weight and working with gravity, also start to break down. And so we don't want that to happen, especially if we want to go to Mars someday, because that's a much longer trip. So we work out two hours a day to maintain that muscle mass and bone density to keep us strong. And we've looked at that through many studies over the years. So it's really important. It's very important for you guys to exercise down there. It's even more important for us up here. Hello, my name is Ernesto and I'm in second grade. And my question is, if we do gymnastics to learn how to do flips, how did you learn how to move in the space station? Yeah, so it is very difficult for you guys to learn how to do tumbling. You have to practice and practice doing flips. And up here, it was getting used to not holding on to everything with your hands all the time. It really was learning that it's okay to bring my feet up and hold on, and you're fine. Everything's okay. Now I can hold on with my hand, but by doing this, um, it kind of taught my brain and my body that I could move in different directions. And for the first month, my brain was pretty confused. If I didn't kind of stay upright in certain parts of the space station, I wouldn't know where I was for a minute or two. Um, but then your brain adapts to always floating and tumbling and somersaulting through the air, and we become much more graceful ballerinas up here. And so it, our brain learns very quickly that we've got all this free space and that we can do all these things. And you just, after a while, you don't even think about it anymore. So during flips or during doing turns and stuff like that, it's almost second nature. Hi, hello, my name is Ryan. And I'm in first grade. And, and we saw that Plankton was was found on the space station. How can plankton get into space? Great question. So plankton, obviously plankton doesn't grow in outer space by itself. It has to be brought up by human means. And so the Russians actually found plankton on the outside of the space station during a special spacewalk they did a few years ago. And we think that plankton got there because we have all these cargo vehicles coming to and from the space station all the time, and that vehicle brought it with it. It had the plankton on it, and it got transferred to the space station. Now, what it shows is that plankton are able to live in space on the surface. So it's an amazing thing if you think about it because there's no air, there's no pressure, and we would not do very well outside the space station by ourselves without a spacesuit. So, but we think that that plankton was brought up by different vehicles. My name is Cray. My name is Cray, and I'm in first grade. My question is, what animals are up in space now with you? So we are about to get uh, a lot of animals up here. Uh, right now, SpaceX is scheduled to dock tomorrow, and they are actually bringing 40 mice with them. And those mice will be living with us for some time up here on the space station. We had mice a few months ago uh, that joined us in July and then left in August as well. Um, we've had bumblebees up here. We've had spiders up here. Um, the Russians, uh, years and years and years and years ago, um, actually had quail up with them, little live baby quail. So we've had animals up here with us before. Um, they have really nice homes that they live in while they're up here. They get fed really well. They're very, very well taken care of. Um, and it's neat to see um, something like mice up here and watch them learn how to move up in space just like we learn how to move. Hi, my name is Nika and I'm in first grade. My question is, how do you learn about the Earth from space? So how do we learn about the Earth from space? Honestly, the best thing that we're able to provide you guys down there is really our eyeball view of the Earth. And we have a beautiful window called the cupola, which is our window to the Earth. And it lets us look out in 360 degrees all around. And we're able to see continents, entire continents, as we cross over them. We're able to see big storms like hurricanes coming. We're able to see the size of those storms. Then we can quickly take pictures. And then once the hurricane's passed, we can take pictures again and, and look at the, sort of the damage that may have been done from that hurricane. So we have a very unique 
viewpoint from up here, kind of what we like to call a big picture view of things that are occurring on the Earth's surface. And we're able to provide that. And we try and do that as much as possible, either through movies or pictures or by just talking to people about what we see. For example, the, the wildfires in California, we were also taking pictures of those and just looking at the destruction that that caused. So it's the, we try and engage as much as possible with that. Um, but I will tell you, looking at the Earth from up here, definitely it, it makes you think about the Earth and how many people live on the Earth. It's, it, it's called perspective. It gives you a different perspective about life on our planet. And one of my favorite things to do is really to look at the Earth at night and look at all the lights in the different countries and even thunderstorms as they cross overhead because it's absolutely beautiful. My name is Daniela, and my question is, are there any future plans to expand the International Space Station? No future plans to add on any more modules. Uh, station is right now what we call assembly complete, meaning we've completed building it, and we're focusing on science right now. We've got a lot of science that's about to hit this station uh, in less than 24 hours. And so right now, though, NASA is looking at going towards the moon, back to the moon, and to Mars. And so we're developing those vehicles to do that, to take us the long distance. And station helps us with that because we're able to look at how we exercise on station, how we eat food on station, how do we go to the bathroom on station. These are all really important things and things that we need to take with us as we go past low Earth orbit. That's where the space station is right now, very close to the Earth's surface but it helps us go past low Earth orbit and on to Mars. Hi, my name is Valentina and I'm in kindergarten. And my question is, do the stars look different in space? You know, we actually get this question a lot um, and they don't, they look a little brighter, but we see the same thing that you do back on the surface. Now we see a lot more and at night we can turn all the lights off in one module and look out the cupola and see the Milky Way anytime we want to. It's really neat. But we see the moon just like you see the moon. We see Venus just like you see Venus. Everything looks the same. Um, so when you get a chance, step outside your house at night. Take a look up in the sky. Get all the lights off and take a look up because it's beautiful. I wish to express on behalf of the Mandelstam family and the Mandelstam School a deep appreciation to Dr. Anyon Chancellor and NASA for this wonderful morning. And I must say, having seen the broadcast today, it's special people like Dr. Anyon Chancellor and agencies like NASA that make this a great country. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mandelstam School. It was great talking with everybody today. Have fun. This is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you to all participants from the Mandelstam School. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications.